Years ago, I read of a young man who said when he was growing up, he was of Jewish parentage, and he said every day when he got ready to leave for school, his mother would kneel down and give him a hug and say, make sure you ask good questions today. Asking the right questions is important, isn't it? In our gospel reading this morning, we're going to read of Jesus asking a couple questions of his disciples. We often read in Scripture of people coming to Jesus with questions. In this case, he has questions for those who are his followers. I'd invite you to follow along. The passage is printed in your bulletin. That way you can underline, circle, mark, make notes, whatever you want to do. It is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a moment, you're going to see appear on the screen a picture of a mystery man. Who is this man? I'm reasonably certain you don't know him. After all, he lived and died a long time before any of us were born, and some of us have been around for a while. I never met him. I have a picture of him given to me by my father years ago, and what little I know about him was revealed to me by my father. Actually, what little I know of him, I learned from a tiny handwritten note in pencil on the back of the picture in my father's handwriting. I know a few things about him because my father revealed it. I know his name and what he did for a living. He was, according to the note, an undertaker in Columbia, Kentucky, a little town in South Central Kentucky, well over a hundred years ago. His name was James Butler Jones. And finally, the one detail that connects me with this unknown man I never met, who died long before I was born, is he was my father's grandfather, my great-grandfather. I would have known none of this had my father not taken the time to give me the photograph with his handwritten note on it, I know who this man is because my father revealed it to me. Otherwise, it would just be a picture of a man I never knew. A number of years ago, my sister and I had the engaging task of sorting through our parents' home, getting it ready for sale. Both parents had died a number of years before, and it befell us to kind of liquidate and get things sorted out. And one of the things I discovered were boxes and boxes and boxes of old photos. Some were folks I recognized, some were identified by notes written on them, some my sister, who's 10 years older, was able to say this is, but you know what, there are boxes of photos of people that I have no idea who they are or what their connection is to me because there's no one left alive who knew them to reveal that to me. I can just look at their pictures and wonder who they are and how we're connected. Maybe you have some photos like that. You don't quite know what to do with them. You look at them and say to yourself, I wonder who that is. Well, in our reading from Matthew's Gospel, we find Jesus asking some questions of identity of his disciples about exactly who he is or whom people perceive him to be. 
He asked these questions of 12 men who had left behind jobs and homes to follow him. In their time with him, they'd heard his teaching, both public and private. They'd seen him perform signs and miracles, everything from amazing healings to walking on water to stilling the wind and the waves to multiplying a few loaves and fish to feed thousands of people. Having spent all this time in his company, having got to know him personally, having traveled from village to village with him, having listened to his words, after watching and seeing all that he said and did, they probably felt that amongst most people, they knew Jesus pretty well. But did they really? Because it seems like just when they thought they were beginning to know and understand him, he would often say or do something that was amazing or inexplicable. And they would look at one another and say, who is this man? Like the photo of my great-grandfather, I think they recognized Jesus, but they were still trying to figure out just who he was. Now, according to the passage we read from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus had just taken his disciples into the region of Caesarea Philippi. You won't find that on a map of Belmont County. That would place them north of the Sea of Galilee, near the slopes of Mount Hermon, near what we today refer to as the Golan Heights. In the time this event occurred in the Gospel, this area would have been I doubt there were as any Jewish presence in this area at all. It was a pretty uh, place to avoid for the Jews. The area was originally called Peneus, named after the Greek god Pan. In fact, there was a famous shrine built there in honor of Pan. Later, the area was renamed by King Herod's son, Philip. King Herod's son wanted to kind of curry influence with the emperor, so he renamed it Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea after Caesar, Philippi after himself. Jesus had left the crowds behind along with the ever skeptical Sadducees, the legalistic Pharisees, to lead his disciples to this area. And in this pagan area, away from the pressing crowds, he has the opportunity to do something he doesn't often get to do, to have a private conversation with his disciples. And he asked them a question. Matthew's account, the question is framed this way. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now if you look in Mark and Luke's accounts of the same event, they record Jesus as saying simply, who do people say that I am? So lest we get tangled up in that title, Son of Man, it may help to point out throughout Matthew's Gospel and often even in Mark and Luke, That is the term Jesus most often uses to refer to himself. In Matthew's Gospel, 28 times at least, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. So Jesus asked the disciples sort of a straw poll, a public opinion. What are you hearing? What are the crowds saying about who I am? Who do the people say that I am? It's pretty non-threatening doesn't require much reflection, personal investment. It's basically, what have you heard? And it was easy enough for them to simply parrot back the sorts of things that they may have heard others say about Jesus. Some say you're John the Baptist. Uh, Others think you could be Elijah. Others think you might be Jeremiah or any one of a number of other Old Testament prophets. That's interesting. They can only perceive Jesus as sort of a rerun of what was. John the Baptist, that's interesting. John's dead. But if you read in Matthew 14, 2, you'll find that King Herod himself, when he heard about Jesus, was a little afraid that Jesus might be John the Baptist come back to haunt him. If you look in Malachi 4, 5, Malachi, that's the last book of the Old Testament, right before you get to Matthew, uh, or as one of my seminary professors used to say, Malachi, the last Italian prophet, Malachi. But if you read in Malachi, Malachi talks about how before Messiah comes, God would send a prophet in the spirit of Elijah to call the people back. So there are apparently some people who thought, well, maybe Jesus is that prophet preparing them for when the Messiah comes. 
And yet others, according to the disciples, thought he might be a prophet along the lines of Jeremiah or any number other of Old Testament prophets. You know what I find interesting? He asked, what are the people saying? And if you go back and read through Matthew, a number of people who had come to Jesus and received healings had made statements about who he was, and the disciples don't quote any of them. In Matthew 8, 28, a man who was demonically possessed had addressed Jesus as the Son of God. In Matthew 9, two blind men referred to him the same way as the Son of God. Matthew 12, 23, the crowd had wondered, could this be the Son of David, meaning the Messiah, the heir to the throne? Matthew 13, 55, in his hometown they said, oh, that's the carpenter's son. We know his mom, we know his family, he grew up down the street. And in Matthew 14, the disciples themselves, after Jesus walked on the water and saved Peter from drowning and stilled the storm at sea, the disciples themselves had worshipped him and said, truly you are the Son of God. But interestingly enough, when Jesus says, who do people say that I am, they don't relay any of those statements. They say, oh, Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, one of those. But it is apparent from the statements of those who'd had encounters with him that, it was, that the crowd was beginning to realize that Jesus was far more than simply an itinerant teacher and preacher from the backwater town of Nazareth. something more. So having polled his disciples about what everybody else was saying, what's the scuttlebutt, what are people passing on, Jesus asked them a second question, and a question that doesn't address hearsay, but their own personal reflection. He gets intensely personal. By the way, you know that God does that, don't you? He gets very personal with us. What about you? Who do you say that I am? Now that's a different matter. You can't just repeat back what you've heard other people saying. Jesus is getting personal. He's asking them to state for themselves what they believe. Through watching him, listening to him, walking with him, following him, what have they come to believe about who he is? And according to Mark, Matthew 16, as well as Mark 8 and Luke 9, only one disciple answers this question. There's at least 12 men there that he asks it. Only one answers and that disciple is Peter. Loud, brash, often outspoken Peter. You know the question I'd like to know that Scripture doesn't tell us? Between the time Jesus asked the question, who do you say I am, and Peter's answer, how much time elapsed? I mean... When he asked his first question, who do people say that I am, I think there was hardly a thought. Everybody goes, oh, well, some think this, some think this. Now he asks for introspection. Now he asks for a personal statement. And I wonder, did Peter just blurt out his answer, just like that? Or perhaps there was a long, awkward pause where the disciples suddenly became really interested in fiddling in the dirt or looking up at the sky or checking their fingernails, looking at one another, each one waiting for someone to say something, each one afraid to give what might be the wrong answer. Matthew doesn't tell us. All we know is that Jesus asked a question of 12 disciples who should by now have a pretty good grasp of things. They've seen, heard, and experienced all the sorts of same things with Jesus, and only one of them gives an answer at all. Who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's quite a statement. In that day, that can get you in a lot of trouble. Jesus is quick to point out to Simon Peter that he hasn't figured it out on his own. Uh, Matthew records, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. Let me translate that. Good answer, Jesus, uh, Peter. Don't give yourself too much credit because you didn't figure this out on your own. 
God revealed it to you. And then Jesus says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There's a play on words there that we miss in the English. You see, in the Greek, Peter is Petros. And literally, that means a detached stone, like you'd pick up out of your driveway off the riverbank. But the Greeks had another word, Petra, and that meant a foundation stone, bedrock. So in essence, what Jesus says is, I tell you that you are a loose stone, Peter. But on this bedrock, I'll build my church and the very gates of Hades will not triumph over it. There are different faith traditions about what exactly this means. Is the bedrock of the church Christ himself? Is it Peter's confession of faith? Is it Christ's teaching? Is it Peter himself? Different faith traditions have different views. Bottom line is this, God can take an unattached loose stone and build on it a church that can stand against the powers of hell itself. By the way, Note that Jesus says the gates of hell will not overcome it. Other translation will not withstand it. You do know, uh, is a gate an offensive or defensive object? You never see any pictures of any army going into battle carrying a gate. You do see pictures of people hiding behind a gate for security. The gate is a defensive structure. Jesus seems to be saying that in the power of his name, his church can assault and overcome the very strongholds of evil itself. And then Jesus adds, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Something I didn't notice until just a little bit ago was he talks about the gates of hell that can't prevail, and then he talks about the keys to heaven. So you don't have to storm heaven's gates. Bible scholars suggest that Peter used these keys in a metaphorical term. On the day of Pentecost, when he announced the door to the kingdom was open to Jews and proselytes, Proselytes simply being people who had converted to Judaism. And others say that it, it was, he used those keys when he announced later that the kingdom of God was even open and welcoming to Gentiles. Have you ever seen a Gentile? Look around you. You're surrounded by them. That's us. Suffice it to say that Petros, Peter, and all those disciples who would follow after him are granted similar authority on earth to bind and to loose. Think about the things we bind and think about the things we loose. And then this passage closes with a somewhat cryptic statement from Jesus. At least it's cryptic to our eyes. Who do people say that I am? Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus ends it all by saying, don't tell anybody this. Sad to say, but I read one pastor who said, this seems to be the one command of Christ that all too many believers still obey. By the way, that prohibition's been lifted. You know that, right? We have an obligation, a compulsion, a responsibility to tell others. At that time, we believe it was something that scholars refer to as the messianic secret. Uh, one, people needed to discover for themselves, not just someone else telling them. The other was that Jesus, I think, did what we would call effective crowd control. You didn't give them too much at one time. When the crowds got too big, because they'd get free bread and free fish when they came to hear him, Jesus would, in the words of uh, a certain card game that pastors shouldn't know anything about, he would up the ante. He would say something like, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. 
and the crowds would thin out. So it's like all of this isn't ready for public consumption yet. So he says, don't tell them. They've got to figure this out. But from that day forward, I'm fairly certain the disciples never looked at Jesus again in the same light. You know, the whole world offers a lot of views of who Jesus is today. If you were to ask the go out and just poll people. Some would say he's a great teacher. Some would say he was a simple man who lived and was later executed by the state. Some would claim he never existed at all. Some would claim that you can't really begin to know who he was or if he ever really even existed. There's too great of a historical distance, too many legends that have grown up around him. Those are some of the things you hear. But within the body, There are some who say he is the Christ, the son of the living God. He lived, healed, and taught, and ushered in the kingdom of God. He suffered and died on a cross, somehow paying a debt that we owed that we could never pay ourselves. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. For 40 days, he interacted and talked and visited with his followers. And after 40 days, he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father in the place of authority. And some say that he's going to come again to claim his bride, the church. And that on that day, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But what really matters is, who do you say Jesus is? Oh, you can play it safe and simply parrot back what you've heard someone else say, but at some point you have to make a personal decision for yourself. Who is Jesus to you? Is he merely a teacher and healer that lived centuries ago? Is he someone you only talk about in the past tense if you talk about him at all? Never mind what you may have heard others say. Who do you say he is? And you need to know whether you verbally answer that question or not. You actively illustrate your answer every day. By the way you live. By the things you do. And the things you don't do. By the words you speak. By the way you treat others. By the way you view others. By the way you view yourself. And even how you make use of the things God has entrusted to you. All of those reflect outwardly to the world who you truly believe Jesus to be. You can say he's your Savior and Lord, but is he? What has he saved you from? Where's there evidence of his lordship over your life and actions? It's not enough to say Jesus is the Son of God, my Lord, the Messiah. Does that ring true if someone were to examine your life? There's an old adage that used to say, sometimes your actions speak so loudly people can't hear what you're saying. Let me put it another way. How you live your life, how you treat others, how you make use of what God has entrusted to you, all of that together reveals who you truly believe Jesus to be. Because anything else is just talk. And you know what they say about talk. Talk is... Who do you say that Jesus is? If you claim him as Lord, are you living in obedience to him? If you profess him as master, are you doing the things he commanded his followers to do? If you acknowledge him as Savior, are you leaving behind the old life? See, a Savior saves you from something. Are you submitting your thoughts and attitudes and actions to his transforming touch? You can poll 100 people and ask them who they believe Jesus to be. You'll get 100 different answers. Bottom line, when all is said and done, you have to ask yourself, who do I believe Jesus to be? And what difference is that? What difference should that make in my life? and the lives of others. I think that still today God reveals that truth to earnest seekers and disciples just as he did in that day. I want to close with a passage of scripture that you've heard already. We read it together early on, but I want to just read it for you. Hear it again. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, 
This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's two words in that passage. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what it means to be conformed? The illustration that, that comes to my memory is when I was a child traveling to Florida with my family. Uh, I can remember stopping at a, a roadside service area and they had this neat vending machine that you had to put some quarters in it and these two halves of a mold came together and this injector came down and injected plastic or vinyl into it and a few minutes later the machine opened and this plastic ugly gray seahorse dropped out the bottom of the machine. When you use a mold, you conform. You take something pliable, something malleable, clay, plastic, resin, and you put it in a mold, squeezes in, and the pressure of that mold shapes and forms it. And each piece out of that mold will be shaped and formed just the same way. Paul says, don't be conformed. Don't let the world shape and form you. But instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I like that because it talks about your mind, not just your heart, not just your feelings, your mind. And there's a wonderful Greek word for transformed. I'm going to teach it to you this morning. You can amaze your friends and families. Okay? It's just one of those words that sticks in my memory because it's just such a cool word. It is, ready for this? Metamorpheo. Isn't that cool sounding? Metamorpheo. Say it with me. Metamorpheo. Try it again. Metamorpheo. Do not be conformed to this world, but be metamorpho. There's an English word that sounds a lot like that. You know what it is? Be transformed. That's what happens when that little woolly caterpillar goes into a pupil stage and seems to die for all the world's knowledge. And eventually that cocoon opens and out comes a creature unlike what went in. Transformed. It's gone through a metamorphosis. Do not be conformed, squeeze into the world's mold, but allow Christ to metamorphosize your mind and your life. It's important to ask the right questions. It's important to carefully consider your answers. And if you say you believe something, it's important to live that out in your daily life. Because anything else is just talk. Bow your heads with me. Gracious God, we too must ask ourselves, who do I say Jesus is? Not just who do I say he is on Sunday morning when I'm dressed in my best sitting in my pew at church. But who do I say he is by the way I treat my family when I get home? Who do I say he is by the way I do my job on Monday? Who do I say he is by how I use the things he's entrusted to me? Who do I say he is by the way I interact with others and respond to human need? Father God, help us to ask the hard questions and help us to find the right answers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.